Good morning, everyone. I'm so privileged to be sharing this morning, Sunday morning service with you on the 24th of May, 2020. I hope that you're safe and sound wherever you are and that through your relationship with God, you are doing more than just surviving, but you're thriving wherever you are. And so let us open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you are our Lord and Saviour and that you protect us from all things. Lord, we ask that even with the rising number of COVID-19 cases in our country and in the world, you will continue to show us how to live a life that reveals to us heaven right here, right now. And so, Lord, into your hands we place our spirits, we place our bodies, we place our lives. Teach us, Lord, and fill us with your spirit of love and grace. We pray this now and forever. Amen. So, how many of you have asked or, or heard the question being asked, are we there yet? It's, it's not just little kids in cars who ask that question, but let's be honest, essentially all of us ask that question, are we there yet? Behind that question is something that I'm going to call the destination disease. We've all suffered from this. Destination disease is the feeling that things are going to get better up ahead, when I get out of school, when the baby lo learns to walk, when the baby learns to feed itself, when the baby's out of nappies, things will be better. When I get a better job, when I get that other car, when I can finally afford a nicer house, then things will be better. When we are out of debt from having bought that nice house, when the kids finally move out, when we, can, when we can afford that dream vacation, when we can retire, or an appropriate one for now, when lockdown is over and COVID-19 is gone. It seems like we are always waiting for something different, something better, and it's like we are never satisfied where we are. We are always reaching forward to the next level or to the next event. And then maybe, just maybe, we will be happy. So we think. And, and unfortunately, we, we drag that kind of thinking into our faith. So many churches and, and many Christian people have fixated all of their hope on that magical destination we call heaven. What many people call eternal life. Many people, maybe you too, think that Jesus simply came to make an arrangement for us to get to heaven. And that is what eternal life is. You going to heaven and living forever in this place that is beyond all of our imagination. This is, this is pretty common, unfortunately, in, in modern religion. And, and the thought that Jesus came to make an arrangement for you to get to heaven and all you have to do is to make sure that you believe properly on the day you die, it's, it's not a healthy way of thinking. It's, it's almost as if we've turned religion into a kind of a pension, having a pension. You know, your pension is reserved for you for some time in the future, but as for now, it's, it's hands off. You can't get to it. For some people... That's their whole attitude towards Jesus and religion. This attitude of saying, he's going to get me into heaven 
one day. And then I'll be able to get my hands on the riches of God. That is incredibly lame thinking, which makes for incredibly lame living. You want to know how eternal life is defined by Jesus in the Bible? Today we read from John's Gospel, chapter 17, verse 1 to 5. We read this. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I have with you before the world began. We continue to read from verse 6 to verse 11. And this is where Jesus now prays for his disciples. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have uh, obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. This is the word of our Lord. Praise be to God. The key verse was specifically verse 3 that said, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is, is not something we are waiting for. Eternal life is not a destination up there. John defined eternal life as knowing the one true God and knowing Jesus Christ knowing him in such a way that it fundamentally changes us. Now, knowing is, is this interesting word. It doesn't mean having facts in your head as much as it means that you are participating in a relationship with intimate knowledge. For instance, I know Tom Cruise from all of those awesome Mission Impossible movies. But do I know him in the same way in which I have a relationship with my friends from high school, who I'm still friends with, or my own children? Of course not. Knowing about Tom Cruise has not changed my life, no matter how good those Mission Impossible movies are. But knowing my friends and family intimately have changed me personally. It is a whole different level 
of knowledge. Eternal life is not waiting for heaven and then it all begins. Eternal life begins right here and now by bringing what's up in heaven into your life right here on earth. Eternal life is life with God right here and now. Eternal life is life for God right here and now. Eternal life is life under God's care right here and now. Eternal life is life by God's power right here and now. Eternal life is life uninterrupted with God right here and now. Eternal life is life fulfilled with God starting right here and right now. Eternal life is abundant, fulfilled life. Eternal life is living in fellowship with God right here, right now. A life that death cannot stop. That's eternal life. You know, what do you think heaven is going to be like? Let me, let me answer that rather simply. Heaven is going to be life with God forever. Heaven will be a place of non-ending fellowship with God. Heaven will be a place of experiencing the perfection and the glory of God. And John is telling us that eternal life begins right here, right now. When we know that God and when we know Jesus. And the good news is we can be with God right here, right now. You know, this right here, right now, knowing of God, I, I think that's the experience which David was trying to share in his Psalm 23. You know, listen to the words of Psalm 23 in this understanding of heaven right here, right now. David says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And you could almost end it off. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Right here right now. That is somebody who is experiencing eternal life right here and now. That is, that is a picture of somebody whose faith is, is not outward waiting, but inward experiencing. That is a picture of somebody who's not just thinking about the future, but is living in the presence. And so we can ask ourselves, what is God's project? What is God's activity in your life right here and now? His project, his activity in your life is to bring what is up there down here to to help you live psalm 23 do you know what jesus called this concept of of bringing heaven from up there to down here well we read it a few weeks ago in john 10 verse 10 is when jesus says i came that they may have life 
and have it abundantly. Heaven right here, right now, is what Jesus called abundant life. It's, it's when heaven gets into you. When you truly know Jesus, that's abundant life. Jesus did not come to make an arrangement for you to get into heaven. He came to give you abundant life here and now. He is right now wanting you to have eternal life. And eternal life is you. Eternal life is you living with God. Living life for God. Living life under God's care. Living life by God's power. Living life with an uninterrupted fellowship with God. Living life in a fulfilled way. You see, eternal life is, is not about the quantity of life forever and ever. <laughs> eternal life is about the quality of the life that you're living now because Jesus is in your soul. Jesus is in your heart, your mind. And because you have this relationship through Jesus with your heavenly Father. Maybe we've been doing it all wrong. Maybe we've been waiting to get in to get to a destination that we've labeled heaven. But this whole time, heaven was trying to get into you. Eternal life was already happening. It had already started. It wasn't something out there in the future. It's a right here, right now moment. My dad used to tell me all the time, he said, remember Wesley, salvation isn't about getting yourself into heaven. It's about getting heaven into you. It's not about your relocation to heaven. It's about your transformation. And so, yes, it's not about getting yourself into the good place. It's about you becoming a good and godly person. You getting into heaven will come soon enough. But while you are still here on earth, it is all about heaven getting into you. And then, here's the key, letting heaven leak out of you spill out of you like your cup is overflowing into all kinds of places into the lives of all those people around you it isn't that what jesus modeled when he lived on this earth he was the man from up there who then lived his life in such a way that he brought up there, down here, where we are. If we read John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 12 to 13, Jesus says, I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe. How can you believe if I told you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And so when you turn aside to the hurting person and instead ignoring them, you assume, you, you assure them of God's love and power, that's heaven breaking into earth. Every time you're in conflict with somebody, instead of hurting them and gossiping and avoiding them, you go back and seek reconciliation and forgiven and forgiveness. That is heaven breaking into the world. 
when you have a chunk of spare money and instead of just funding your own kingdom, you give sacrifice, you give sacrificially to make a difference, then a little bit of heaven is touching earth. Every time somebody with an addiction stops hiding and starts acknowledging the truth, a little bit of heaven is breaking upon the earth. You see, Jesus wants to live inside of you here and now. Eventually, this will mean that you will go to heaven, absolutely. But in the meantime, he wants to bring heaven into you and then he wants you to bring heaven into the earth. It's right there in this prayer from John's Gospel, chapter 17. But it's also there in Jesus' other prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The things that have gone terribly wrong in you, he wants to make right. And then he wants to transform you into an entirely different kind of person. The kind of person who leaks, who pours out heaven wherever he or she is. But how do we start this heavenly, eternal life journey. How does it happen? Where does it begin? It starts really with just two words. Two words that Jesus asked many, many people. The words are, follow me. Follow me. Jesus simply asked Matthew, follow me. Jesus asked Peter, follow me. Jesus asked James and John, follow me. Jesus asked the rich man, follow me. And to the huge crowd, what did Jesus ask? Did he ask them to become a Christian? No, in Mark 8 verse 34 we read, and on calling the crowd to him, with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. And there is the essence. There is the essence of this heavenly journey of this eternal life experience. It's to take the first steps to follow Jesus. In fact, Jesus defies, defines what it means to follow him. We, we don't get to make it up. There is a choice to be made. There is my own personal agenda that needs to be denied. And then there is a cause of Jesus to take up. Jesus asked people to follow him, not to say a magic prayer to get them into heaven. Jesus asked people to follow him. He never asked anyone to get a ticket for eternal life, only to be kept in our back pockets when we needed it. But, but when, P, when Jesus asked people to follow him, they had to leave something behind because they had to put down what was important to them and pick up the things that, were imp that are important to Jesus. You see, to follow Jesus means that he will be your teacher, that you will learn from him, that you will take your guidance from him. That whatever he says will be the authority over your life. You will follow his ways. You will listen to what he says. You will do what he does. 
You will believe what he believes and you will go where he goes. His agenda will be first and yours will be second. He never asked you to get your ticket to heaven. He asked you to follow him so that you can know heaven and help create heaven. Personally, I, I think it would be awesome to believe and to live and to act just like Jesus believed and thought and acted. You know, to be able to do what Jesus did, to be able to be more like Jesus, for me, that would be abundant life. You know, here is how Paul put it into words, the, the experiencing of following Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 to 7, Paul explains what it means to follow Jesus by saying this. He says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Paul calls following Jesus as being alive. Whatever he was before, having followed Jesus, he calls being dead. Before Jesus equals death. After Jesus equals life. Before Jesus equals darkness. After Jesus equals life. Before Jesus, there was nothing. But after Jesus, there is everything. Before Jesus, Paul says, I was living by my own feelings and desires. But after following Jesus, the Holy Spirit guides my desires. That is the experience of heaven coming into you. And so as we close to today, may this be our little prayer as we hope to follow Jesus so as to know abundant living, which is the experience of heaven and eternal life right here, right now. Let me invite you to say this prayer with me. Lord, I invite everything in heaven to come down here and transform me. I want to follow you. I want to learn from you. I want to be a different kind of person. I don't want to wait until I get to heaven. Let me start experiencing heaven right here and now. This I pray. Amen. May you have a blessed week. May you look after yourselves and your loved ones. And once again, the offer is always there. If you ever need to talk, please give me a phone call. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.